Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed class. Let me get my uh, headphones on here. So now I can hear myself talk. It's always good to hear that so I can see whether the music's too loud. Let me turn that down a little bit. And I'll put myself up just a little bit. So we are all set. Now we're just going to wait for people to tune in for tonight's class. So this will finish up week two of a five-week program. We're going to uh, finish up with what we were talking about last night with inattention blindness and then get right into probably one of my favorite classes to teach, which is sign signals and pavement markings because it makes sense of that crazy world that we have out there um, because when we drive it's too easy just to look at the road and not look at signs well we're up to six people remember to sign in on your phone let me know that you're here um while we wait for a few more people to pop on uh for the five of you that are watching right now uh we gotta start scheduling some time if you do not have four hours of drive-in with me right now. You are lagging behind. Our goal was to drive twice a week for the five weeks, so you would be done, all right? So if you don't have logged in four hours, we are officially a little bit behind. Doesn't mean we can't catch up, but remember, next week is our midway point. We not only have the midterm, but we're halfway through our drive times, and then after that, then we're gonna have to mix you in with the new class that will be starting up four or five days after you end. Uh, so it does, it goes by quickly. I know it doesn't seem that way, uh, especially since you have to be online all day long. So I do kind of feel bad for you that uh, you have to sit behind a computer all day long and take in all this information. So hopefully, uh, this class, uh, I know it's at the end of the day, and I know you're probably just tuckered out, uh, but I do appreciate you putting in the time and the effort to take down notes and get all this information. I hope that you did your homework. I'm not really receiving much. I don't know what's going on, but some people are texting me their questions, their posters, their worksheets, things like that. We're going to go back online uh, after tonight's class. Let me get right out of the music because I think we have just about everybody here. Let's just tune that right down. Let me stop that. Uh, so at the end of tonight's class, uh, do go to our remote Facebook page. I will be posting questions relating to tonight's topic on sign signals and pavement markings. That way I have a uh, at least a score of how well that you did on uh, this material. So the last couple chapters that you had to do was just doing the questions at the end of the chapter, writing it on a piece of paper, taking a picture of it, and sending it my way. That's how I wanted to collect uh, the homework. So let's kind of get right into where we dropped off from, from last night when we were talking about inattention blindness. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but I will tell you that I had two people today that were going to go through stop signs. I had one person that did not see a car backing out of a parking spot while we were driving. Inattention blindness is real, okay? Things change. Things are present, but we're not picking them up. So we have to do a better job at uh, scanning our driving environment and picking up potential hazards before they become serious problems. So this is really why I'm spending a little bit of time on this. Uh, let's take a look at an overview video of inattention blindness. So let me show you the video first. You are about to take part in a quick experiment. Take a look at this. Okay, now. Did you happen to notice anything odd? Watch again. See any changes? Don't worry if you didn't see that it's two different men. It means your brain is doing exactly what it should be. 
It's focusing on the meaning of the scene rather than on the irrelevant details. Imagine how much energy and brain mass it would take for us to remember every single person, place, or thing we encountered. The things that matter, a conversation with a coworker, or your child's first step, would be drowned by a deluge of information. So when there are minor changes to the world around us, we often don't pick up on them. There are two similar phenomena at work. Inattentional blindness is the failure to notice something that's fully obvious right there in front of you when your attention is engaged on something or someone else. Change blindness is a failure to notice a difference between what's there right now and what was there a moment ago. Scientists such as Daniel Simons from the University of Illinois have spent years devising experiments testing just how perceptive and unperceptive humans actually are. So we feel like we're aware of everything, that we're taking in all of the details, and that if something unimportant happens, we'll automatically notice it. It'll capture our attention. The reality is that we often don't notice unexpected things because we're aware of far less of our world than we think we are. So how much or how little are we actually aware of? We decided to recreate one of Simon's most famous experiments to see for ourselves. Here's the setup. Our senior series producer, Vin, poses as a lost pedestrian and asks a passerby for directions. Excuse me, I'm looking for the skyline. Then, we break the two up, walking through them holding a large sheet of wood. Now watch as I replace Vin. You might think people would notice the switch, but almost half the time, they didn't. Of course, that means more than half the time they did. We only tried the experiment nine times, and by no means was it good science. But we were surprised four people didn't notice the switch. In Simon's original experiment, seven out of 15 people didn't either. So what determines whether or not you can figure out the switch? When you look at another person, you encode what's relevant for what you're doing right then, in that case, giving directions. And you don't pay attention to the details that are irrelevant, say what color their shirt is or exactly how tall they are. As long as you are able to make sense of the meaning of the scene and roughly the main categories of that person, um, say their height, their age, what race they are, what sex they are, as long as those important things don't change, the meaning of the scene really hasn't changed and you're not going to notice that anything's different. Scientists have documented inattentional and change blindness since the 1970s, and while they allow you to focus your attention, this failure to see every detail can prove costly. Drivers often cause accidents because they overlook quick changes to their environments, such as pedestrians or cyclists. Faulty memories can wreak havoc during eyewitness testimony. The goal of vision isn't to build a photograph or a complete model of the world in your mind. The goal of vision is to make sense of the meaning of the world around you. Being aware of our limitations can help us adapt and compensate for them, allowing us to do things that prevent the really negative consequences that can happen due to failures of awareness. For example, Simons thinks that people might be willing to put away their cell phone when driving if they just understood the limits to their attention. Juries might realize that eyewitness testimony is far from ideal. And the next time you and a friend are fighting about the details of a past event, it's likely you're both wrong. Now that's something to remember. So I like how they tied it in with driving, with being distracted. And that is really the main focus that we want to take a look at is if we're not truly focused on the roadway, uh, what are we really missing? Are we missing the bicyclists? Are we missing traffic signs? Are we missing traffic lights? Uh, it, it, it is so easy when you're driving to, to know a route and know where you're going to be turning next to kind of turn off your mind a little bit where you're just really on autopilot. Your mind is just telling your hands and your feet, keep me between the yellow and the white line, and that's how you're driving because uh, everything else is just going to be a blur and you're blocking out and we don't want to be like that. So we have to kind of clear our mind, uh, stay focused on everything that's coming towards us. So let's go back into what we were talking about. Um, I don't have this anymore. This was a lot of fun. I used to show this in class to students and uh, they showed you about a 15 second clip and then I would ask the students, how many things changed? How many things did you see change? And everybody would write down a number, and some people would say four, five, six. Within that 15-second clip, they changed 21 different things. It's incredible that they could actually change 21 things in a 15-second clip. 
but um, but they did. I'll see if I can try to find it. I may have it on a different computer. Okay, once you write down peripheral vision, we talked about this yesterday. It's the 180 degree area from the left side of your um, body to the right side. Uh, it helps you to detect light, moving objects. It does not help you with your focal vision with detail. Everything uh, has to, uh, your head has to turn for you in, in order for you to actually read things. Uh, it's a scanning tool, so we have to be very selective of how we turn our heads to pick up this type of information. Now, there are four other types of vision that I want to mention. Color vision, night vision, glare, and uh, glare vision, and glare recovery. So the first one with color vision, you must be able to recognize traffic signs, signals, pavement markings. Um, we need to know where turn signals, hazard lights, backup lights, brake lights are located uh, in order to know what they're trying to inform us of. Now, I would almost bet that most of you do not know the color of parking lights, all right? So I'm gonna keep talking and I want you to put it in the comment section on YouTube. So if you're part of the YouTube group that's got your name up there, kind of play along. What color are parking lights, okay? Uh, drivers can compensate for color blindness. My son-in-law, is colorblind. He really is pretty bad uh, on certain colors. Blues, greens, purples, browns, no clue. It really, it really doesn't. Um, so how do people that are colorblind know that the traffic light's going from red to green? Because they can tell what light is changing by the intensity of the light that's coming through the lens. So we know that red is on top, we know yellow is in the middle and green is at the bottom. So if you just know, um, see Troy's at, um, putting something in here. I'm going to read Troy's message here. Yes, Troy, I saw that. Um, it's, I think, gorilla. Yeah, and a gorilla suit. That's a good one. I have seen that. I haven't been able to download it, though. But it's the same principle. It's the same group of people that are doing all these videos. Yeah, you're right. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Jake comes up with yellow or white for parking lights. Okay, let's see who else is gonna uh, give us a, an idea of what color your parking lights are. Now, the next thing I want you to write down is night vision. Um, Sabrina says white, okay? Um, night vision, ability to see in low variable light conditions. Remember the state requires you to, to log in 10 hours of night driving before you go for your license. So make sure um, you get the experience of doing that because it's only getting lighter as we go along. So it's getting dark now around 4.35 o'clock, so it's easy to get night hours in. But if you're taking driver's ed in um, the summertime, it doesn't usually get um, dark out until around 8, 8.30. And by then, your parents don't want to go out and drive with you. So try to log in those 10 hours uh, sometime in the next two, three months, if you can. Uh, I drove with someone tonight at five o'clock. Uh, I don't mind driving that late. It's just kind of hard to get back here, get a bite to eat and get class set up. But if some people want to drive at five o'clock to get some night experience with me, by all means, let me know and we'll see if we can schedule you in. Usually when you get older, your eyes start to diminish. I never wore glasses until I was in my late 40s. And now when I take my glasses off, um, it's kind of difficult to see anything within like three feet, four feet of me clearly. I still have pretty good vision uh, distance wise, so I could probably still drive, pick up my signs and read them. But if I had to read my speedometer while I was driving, um, I wouldn't have a really a good idea of how fast I was really going. Good thing for a digital speedometer. It's kind of easy to see those big numbers. Other concerns are headlight glare for cars coming towards you, dark windshields, properly aimed and dirty headlights and dirty windshields will also create or poorly 
aimed and dirty headlights and dirty windshields will create a problem. Uh, if you can't see as well as you do, do during the daytime, you should always go at a slower speed. I always recommend going at the speed limit or about two, three miles slower until you get used to driving at night. And then going the speed limit is usually, you know, something that you want to always try to do day or night. But when you're learning something and you're not familiar with an area, a slower speed will always give you that extra second or two to uh, react to things that are coming. I'm going to go back to the comments here. And a few of you did share. Not everybody put a comment up here. But um, no one except Jake, okay, got it right. Jake gave me two answers, so I can't actually give you total credit, Jake. But parking, your parking lights are yellow, all right? Your parking lights are yellow. Your white lights are your backup lights. And, of course, red lights are your brake lights in the back your tail lights. So when your headlights are on and you're got your uh, car driving down the road, people need to know where your back end is. So it's all illuminated by a red light. When you step on the brake, that red light illuminates. It gets a little bit brighter, indicating it's a brake light now. So your yellow lights, which would also be your directional lights, okay, um, would indicate that you're parking. So emergency lights, parking lights, um, directionals will um, indicate what your car is actually doing. Uh, glare vision, the ability to see when there's rapid increase of light. Uh, driving into the sun, sunlight reflects off bright, shiny surfaces such as uh, water, and snow, uh, sometimes metal like on other vehicles. And glasses should be worn but don't rely on the sun visor. So I'm a big proponent of sunglasses. So always bring sunglasses with you. Uh, that's going to be helpful. So let's talk a little bit about communication. Now, we use our turn signals. We use our backup lights. We use things to give information to other people of what we're doing or not doing. So what timely communications will do, and I want you to write this down because we are going to talk about road rage I don't know if we'll do it next week. I know it's supposed to be next Tuesday, but uh, we'll have to see if we have enough time. Uh, we may, because I think tonight's class is going to run over. I can almost tell already. So write down with timely communications, you are providing a courteous, cooperative attitude behind the wheel. It shows that you are trying to be a good driver, that you want to help other people out to give them an idea of what you're doing. So it gives you and others the time needed to see and respond to the situations that are up ahead. The other thing about uh, giving timely communications, it will really make you less stressful because people will react to those directionals, those backup lights, and they'll give you the space and time needed to complete whatever you're trying to do. When you don't communicate, people will kind of take advantage of you. So be very careful of that. So it reduces the risk to yourself and others. So untimely or non-communication, where we don't do this, we show in a competitive, aggressive, uncooperative attitude. This is part of being um, incensed behind the wheel or what we call road rage. It decreases the amount of time one needs to see and understand the actions of other users on the roadway. It requires reaction rather than response. See, I would rather respond to um, a car that's trying to pull out into traffic, slow down and let him out because I see his directional, I want to help him out. So it's, it's easy for me to respond to what they're trying to do. I hate to react because it puts me on edge. It puts me where I've got to do the correct thing with my position, with my speed. So it increases anxiety it increases stress level inside the car. And it makes things a little bit risky. Close calls. If it's a close call, it's probably lack of communication. Someone did not uh, indicate that something was going to happen. They just did something. And now everybody has to react to that bad behavior behind the wheel. 
This is why we're trying to train everybody to do the right thing. If everybody did the right thing, driving would be so much easier, so much more fun. But now it's just like, wow, I can't believe that people go down the wrong way on streets. They don't use signals. They don't stop at stop signs. It's not fair for everybody else that's following the rules and doing the things that they should. So I want you to write this down. Ways that you can communicate. Headlights are used to be seen. I always, always drive with headlights on. We call them day running lights. It's not for us to see the road. It is for people to see us. So headlights should always be on. Signal lights. Always try to give people a warning that you're making a turn. So last night we learned it was 100 feet in town, 500 feet on the open road. That translates to probably about three to five seconds. When people see your directionals on three to five seconds, it gives them time to do what they need to do. Brake lights, you should always use early and you should know the speed that you're traveling uh, and the distance that you need to come to a stop. Reverse lights, which are white, not yellow, are to warn other people that you're backing up. The horn, I will bet nobody uses the horn in class. I will bet you we get through the whole 10 hours with everybody and nobody's going to use it. It's to let people know where you are. It's to make people look at you. It's not to show d- disgust. Okay, it's not out of anger. It's out of, you want, it's a warning. It's like, hey, hey, look at me. I'm over here. Hand signals we talked about if your uh, directional lights aren't working. We talked about your lane position last night. Center, left of center, right of center, far right, far left. Uh, I think this happened uh, today with a driver. Someone went over the, the yellow line towards us. And I said, you got to go far right. You know, it's because there was something that caused the oncoming car to cross over. It wasn't that they were trying to be a jerk or trying to scare us. Is that that is what was needed. We had to pick up on that. And speed, always go slow, approaching turns, curves, and hills. Wherever you don't know what's lurking just beyond, you should change your position and change your speed to benefit you where you think the problem's going to be. Okay, never assume. Never assume. So what are some of the common errors uh, about communicating? Forgot to use my signal. Forget to put my lights on. It's very easy to, for, to be forgetful. So we want to try to instill these behaviors into you, into your driving so they become lifelong habits. Sometimes people don't do things because they're late. Their mind's racing and it's just like, oh, it's another thing to do. I'm just not going to do it. We talked about wrong information. You want to turn right, but you put your left signal on. Or you go the wrong direction, okay? You don't want to communicate that type of behavior. So my philosophy about turn signals is this. So think about this. It's better to have them on, talking about turn signals, and not need them than to need them and not have them on. So... Overuse your directional rather than underuse your directional, okay? As long as you're, you're going to the right or going to the left, even if it's around a bend, even if it's around a traffic circle, you really don't need it. You don't need your signal on at a traffic circle or a rotary until you get out. But some people, the minute they hit the yield sign, they put their signal on. Just make sure you put the right one on, not the left one. So that takes care of communication. So the next slide that we have is dealing with signs. So if I can find, whoop, nope, wrong one. Here we go. All right. So sign signals, pavement markings, how to make sense of the road ahead for safe travel. So this is a uh, area that I take all of you on. Every single one of you have driven down this area near the junior high where we're approaching Um, a four-way stop. So just notice in this little picture here, all the information that we have. We have signs, we have lines, we have crosswalks, we have a car to the left. 
we have open space to the right and straight ahead. So scanning the area, you're going to have to pick up all that information, process what you need to pay attention to, and utilize it to make safe passage through this intersection. A lot of people get confused and they don't even realize this is a one-way street. So when I tell you to, to stay to the left for the first time, I think most of you think I'm crazy. You're thinking, why is Mr. Till having me drive on the wrong side of the road? You don't realize it's a one-way street. All right, we're going to have a little bit of fun right now. So get a blank piece of paper. Um, let me uh, start something here. So get a piece of paper. Um, I've got to change something here. So hold on. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a test. Okay. So I'm going to give you roughly, I'll go up, I'll go up to eight minutes. All right. So here we go. You've got eight minutes and I want you to do this worksheet. All right. So read the instructions, look at the symbols. You're matching the symbols to the words down below. So you've got eight minutes to do this and then you're going to text this to me. All right. You've got eight minutes. Go.
Okay, you're down to your last minute, so try to wrap this up. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We are out of time. So uh, submit to me what you have. Uh, text it to me so I can see what you've got for answers. So I'm going to give you a, just a moment to text that to me. And while you do that, um, I want you to know that I've been giving this for over 20 years, this sample test and I would say the majority of people do not do very well so don't expect yourself to get a very high score uh, because most people do not read instructions most people do not um, do a lot of reading in driver's ed there are a lot a last minute everybody thinks driver's ed is a lot like physical education you know, any type of test in phys ed is going to be pretty simple till it comes time that they ask you all the rules about badminton. And then um, it's hard to remember what they taught you. So the same thing about signs and signals. And what most people will say, well, I can read it or I know what to do when I'm driving. Well, guess what? You're never going to get to drive if you can't pass a written test. So you need to know your signs and your signals. Um, this is why we're going to spend some time on this. Your written test is 10. They're going to give you 10 signs. Okay. Don't think they're going to give you something that is as simple as number 23. If you get number 23 wrong, I am starting you all over. You are not completing driver's ed. You are going back to the beginning of driver's ed and doing your reading and everything else that you're supposed to be doing. By the way, this is not supposed to be a very difficult uh, test. This is actually very easy. And I'll show you in a moment. I'm still waiting for a few people to reply and give me their, uh, their test, their copy. So, um, Mr. Smith, where's yours? I do not see Jack Smith. Jack Smith, I want you to text me right now. This is not good because I am not getting much information from you. And this is not good. Because I see that you logged in at the beginning of class, but I have a feeling you are no longer here. And if you're not, we got some serious issues. So I'm going to wait just a moment for Mr. Smith to text me. If he doesn't, then we're going to move right along. Okay, part of the class is that you've got to participate. You have to log on and do all this material or you do not get credit for driver's ed which means you must repeat it so mr smith you will be getting a phone call all right here we go let's take a look at the signs let me get back up here where is it signs okay if you take a look at the symbols up above a, C, E, G, I. Jack, you say that you are present, but you are not giving me any indication when I'm asking questions or for people to send things in. You do not text in at the beginning. I see you up here at uh, the comments. Um, how come you didn't do this worksheet? All right. I'm, you're going to have to call me at the end of tonight's class. I want to speak to you. Um, 
back to A, C, E, G, and I. All those have one meaning. So once you use that, you don't use them again. All right? So once you've used those down below, you don't use them again. If you take a look at D and F, the color is orange. If you did your reading, you know that orange is for construction. All right? Construction. So if it has nothing to do with construction, then you don't have to use them again. The rest of the test was between B and H. B and H. So it should have been very easy. So let's go through it really quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. So question number one, 35 miles per hour is H. That's a law. Two, bump is B. Three, dead end is B. Four, detour is D. Five, detour, 1,000 feet, F. Six, divided highway ends, B. Seven, do not enter, G. Eight, do not pass, H. Nine, end of construction, F. Ten, flagman, 500 feet, D. Eleven, hill is B. Twelve, left turn is H. Thirteen, no parking anytime, H. Fourteen, no passing zone is C. Fifteen, no turn on red is H. Sixteen, no U-turn, H. Seventeen, pass with care, H. Eighteen, road machinery ahead is D. Nineteen, road narrows is B. Slippery when wet is B. Soft shoulder is B. That's a warning. Speed limit is H. Like I said, if you got 23 wrong, shame on you. 24, B. 25, B. 26, H. 27, truck route, H. 28, B. 29, I. And 30 is E. Now, I went through these kind of quickly. Uh, if you want me to send you um, a, a picture of this, just text me, and I'll just snap a picture of the answered um, test sheet here, and you can use that as a study guide. But on the midterm next week, we are going to have at least 30 to 40 signs, okay? Um, multiple choice, so it's not matching, but multiple choice, so there's going to be a heavy representation on the midterm with, with signs, so... Uh, you're going to have to know these and how to figure it out. So let's get right into back to the PowerPoint. So what I want you to realize is that information on signs can be very complicated. So we have three signs here with different um, colors, with different numbers, uh, time frames. When you're moving, it's really hard to process. Now, these are parking signs, so you'd probably be stopped while you're reading this. You wouldn't be moving and have to read these three signs grouped together. Uh, that'd be kind of unfair. And that's basically why they don't use words on most signs. If they can, it's easier to communicate symbols rather than signs because you can see it from a further distance and it's easier for your mind to process. Think about that. Symbols are easier to interpret. Just think if you went to another country, you should be able to drive because you would probably be able to figure out what the symbol means, like handicap or children crossing. Um, but if they w wrote down what the Spanish word for pedestrians were, you probably wouldn't know it unless you studied Spanish. So it's really uh, good to know uh, how to figure out signs. So what I want you to write down in your notes, this is how we want to break down your uh, thought process when it comes to memori memorizing signs. Every sign that you see on the side of the road, break it down into one of these four categories, okay? Color, shape, regulatory, which means law, and four is warning. So every sign has a shape, has a color, 
and it's either going to be a law or it's going to be a warning. Okay? Now, we're really in need of understanding laws because we know if we break a law, there's a chance we're going to get a ticket. So we don't want to get a moving violation. So the regulatory signs, we really need to know. Warning signs is beneficial, but if you miss, uh, let's say, a deer crossing sign, it's not the end of the world because the chances that there's going to be a deer on the side of the road, pretty slim, pretty slim. You know, playground up ahead, you're going by the sign at 11 o'clock at night. Probably no kids are on the playground 11 o'clock at night. So if you miss that sign at night, not the biggest deal. Um, But a stop sign, wrong way sign, those are regulatory. We've got to know those. Now, of all the signs, the most important sign to know is the color red. Because red is telling you not to do something. That's what prohibition means. So stop a prohibition. And of course, the sign that comes to mind when we think of a red sign is the stop sign. But also the wrong way or do not enter sign are also considered red regulatory signs. So the bottom picture is often off ramp. And the picture up ahead is just a basic intersection. But of the picture up ahead, where you have the stop sign and the line Notice the difference of where the line is. Why don't they put the line right next to the sign? Because you'd be too far away from the roadway. You wouldn't be able to see well enough. But they need to to tell you that you need to stop. So they always kind of move the sign up a little bit further uh, from where the stop line is usually. Okay. So given the choice between stopping at the sign or the line, stop at the line. Now, if you can't see the line, rain, snow, dirt, darkness, stop at the sign and then creep up, do those safety stops. So stopping at a line is considered your legal, your legal, and then your um, inching up is your safety stops. So what is the difference between a rolling stop and a resting stop? Um, The best thing that I can explain to you, and this is a picture outside um, near my front yard, um, is that most people coming around from the left here do not stop at that stop line off to the left. It's because they're they're looking where cars are coming from and they're turning right. Put this down in your notes. Most people roll through stop signs if they're going right. Or going straight. Very rarely do people roll stop signs if they're turning left because by nature you get in the habit of looking to the left and looking to the right, making sure no one's coming and then you make your turn. So you're more apt to stop when you're turning left. Right, you keep your eyes focused on where traffic is coming from and in your mind because you're going so slow, you think you have stopped, but in actuality you haven't. There's still a rotation of the tires. Okay, so if the tires never have a pitch, uh, if they never stop rotating, um, then it is a rolling stop. We already talked about stop lines. Okay, white signs. Uh, White can be broken down into three categories, so I want you to write this down. A white sign, that's white with black lettering is telling you to do something like a speed limit. A white sign with red lettering is telling you not to do something. A white sign with green lettering is guiding you to what is legal. So sometimes what you're doing is legal. Sometimes what you're doing, it's illegal. So in the case here, you can park between 8 and 5, Monday through Friday. But you can only park for two hours between 8 and 5. But on Saturday, Sunday, you can park there all day. So most people don't realize that that white signs do have different meanings. So white with black telling you to do something. White with red telling you not to do something. White with green is guiding you to what is legal. The next color is a blue sign. Blue signs are usually located on the highway. It is motorist services. 
So some of the things that they could be communicating would be telephone. Here you've got a uh, handicap, could be lodging, could be restaurants, um, could be gas, camping. All these things uh, would alert you to what exit to take. So we find blue signs more than likely on a highway. Although you do see a couple, like on 108, 155, there may be a blue sign here or there. But for the most part, highway. Yellow is the most common type of sign that we have out on the road. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yellow signs. So what I want you to do, I want uh, everybody to text me a type of a yellow sign. What would you find on a yellow sign? And I'm going to take a look at it, and I'm going to see uh, what people come up for answers. What What's the yellow sign that comes up to mind? Can't use any of the ones that we have up ahead, all right? So you cannot use uh, school crossing. You cannot do slippery when wet, and you cannot do stop sign up ahead because that's right in front of you. So you can't give me what I'm giving you. you got to give me a different yellow sign. So text me a different yellow sign so I know that you are still here and that you are paying attention to what is being discussed. Now, with yellow signs, there's two categories. The first category is regular. Um, your ye regular yellow sign. And then anything that's that greenish type would be a crossing sign or pedestrian sign. Okay, that's when you're going to see those. And like I said, you got lots of them. So Sonia already texted me one, which is good. Okay, Marcus just texted me one. So keep on texting. Let's see who comes up with some more. The next color... Can't use pedestrian crossing. Dead end. Dead end. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, here's a school sign. It's not your typical shape for a school sign, but it's alerting you to what the school speed is. Uh, we are going uh, lane ends. That's a good one, Hillary. Um, I do want you to write down the times on the picture to the left. Intersections, a good one. Good one with intersections. So write down 8.15 to 9 o'clock. 2.45 to 3.30. So school zone speeds are going to be Monday through Friday, 45 minutes before school opens, 45 minutes when school closes. All right? So those are school speed limit signs. You've got yellow up ahead to tell you it's a school speed. All right? So it's a combination of two things. One, it's warning you of the school the white sign's telling you the law. Now, notice the speed limit. Both these speed limits are from Mohermit. One is on um, Town Hall Road, which is the 25 mile an hour speed limit. And the one that's on 155 is 30 because the speed limit on 155 is 40 miles per hour and the speed limit on Townhouse Road is 35. So it's 10 miles below the posted speed limit, 45 minutes before school opens and 45 minutes when school closes. Uh, green is also a sign that we find on the highway, giving you direction or guidance. We can find uh, green in town. Those are your street signs. So we do see some of these signs other places, but there is like a, um, a hierarchy of where you usually find it or percentage wise, more likely on highways. I thought this was uh, kind of interesting. My nephew lives on the uh, West Coast in Oregon and uh, Interstate 20. If you head east and Interstate 20 goes all the way from Massachusetts to the West Coast. So if you stayed on Interstate 20, you could get to Boston, Massachusetts and never leave that road. But you're going to be traveling 3,365 miles. Do you know how long that's going to take you? It's going to take you a couple days because th this isn't a major highway. This is, you know, probably speeds l limits of 40, 50, 55 with traffic lights and stop signs. 
So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, Brown is the least used sign that we find out on the highway. That means recreation. Orange construction. And remember, orange comes in two shapes. It comes in your diamond shape, which we have up here. And then there's a rectangle down at the bottom. One is war, and that's on the worksheet that I gave you. What, because people say, why don't we just have one orange sign? Well, one is a warning. One is directing you. So the bottom sign is directing you to what you can do and what you can't do. And the top signs are warning you of what's going to be happening up ahead. You're going to have to go to the right up ahead. The one up ahead is telling you that construction's up ahead. Okay, traffic signals. You do need to know from top to bottom, red, yellow, green. Now, if you take a look at the, the picture, most people will say, well, Mr. Toll, why is the yellow light on top? It's not on top. That is a red light. It just looks yellow. The camera didn't really represent the true color of red. Have you ever taken a picture and someone's eyes look red? Sometimes cameras just don't get, you know, what it's taking a picture of correctly. So it's not a true representation. So no one has red eyes. And just like that sign is not a yellow light, it's red. And the other way we can tell that it's a red light is that there's a pedestrian crossing signal at six seconds left to cross the street. So we know everybody, those trucks to the right have to stop and more stop. So there is information. So don't get few, uh, fooled by what you think is a yellow light. So if you had like sunglasses on and let's say there were like, you know, greenish or yellowish lenses on your sunglasses, it's going to really, you know, make everything else funky what you look at. So don't get confused. You've got to know yellow is in the middle, red's on top and green's down below. Uh, sometimes traffic lights can be very confusing. Now this is actually a piece of art. Uh, this isn't actually a traffic light, but if you are in that area uh, driving, wouldn't that get your attention? And wouldn't you kind of, you know, do a double take? Uh, you, so don't be confused with traffic lights. Got to think out and process before you get to the intersection. So how do traffic lights actually change? A lot of people believe that it's on for two minutes and off for two minutes, on for two minutes, off. So there's a, a sequence, there's a timing to the traffic light. And in some cases that is actually true. But what I want you to write down in your notes is that traffic lights change according to traffic flow. We want the highest volume of traffic to go through an intersection. So there are metal sensors underneath the pavement that senses when cars are still traveling over that area. So as long as that area is being traveled over, it will probably stay green. The minute they don't get another signal from another vehicle going over that area, and we have cars waiting from the left or to the right, then the light's going to change. Because of computer systems, because of technology, intersections have become very complex and we're doing everything with computer systems. So I'm going to show you a video of how we get traffic in a city through uh, quickly and safely. If you live in a major city, I can take a pretty good guess at one of your most common frustrations, traffic. In city driving, the journey is rarely better than the destination. In most cases, we just want to get where we're going. Traffic is not just frustrating, but it has consequences to the environment as well. All those idling vehicles have an impact on air quality. When you're stuck and sitting behind a long line of cars, it's easy to let your mind wander over solutions to our traffic woes. But traffic management in dense urban areas is an extremely complex problem with a host of conflicting goals and challenges. One of the most fundamental of those challenges happens at an intersection, where multiple streams of traffic, including vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians, need to safely, and with any luck, efficiently cross each other's paths. Over the years, we've developed quite a few ways to manage this challenge of who gets to go and who gets to wait, from simple signs to roundabouts, but one of the most common ways we control the right-of-way at intersections is the traffic signal. 
I'm Grady and this is Public Works, my video series on infrastructure and the human-made world around us. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, more on that later. There are a lot of good analogies between cities and human anatomy, and roadways are no exception. Highways are like the aorta, with a high capacity and single major destination. Small collector roads are like the capillaries, with not much capacity but a connection to every individual house and business. And in between are the aptly named arterial roadways, the medium capacity connections between urban centers. Rather than ramps, overpasses, and access roads to control the flow of traffic, arterial roads use at-grade intersections through which only a few traffic streams can pass at a time. We call this interrupted traffic flow for obvious reasons. In most cases, these intersections are the limit to the maximum throughput of the roadway. In other words, increasing the number of lanes or speed limit won't have any effect on the overall capacity of the road. The only way to increase the number of vehicles that safely travel from point A to B is to increase the efficiency of the intersection. In addition, these intersections are where a vast majority of accidents occur. For these reasons, traffic engineers put a lot of thought and analysis into the design of intersections and how to make them as safe and efficient as possible. Controlling the flow of traffic through an intersection, otherwise known as assigning right-of-way, is an enormous challenge and almost always requires a compromise of numerous conflicting considerations, including space, cost, approach speed, cycle time, site distance, types and volumes of traffic, and human factors like habits, expectations, and reaction times. Intersections also need to be rigidly standardized so that when you come to an unfamiliar one, you already know your role in the careful and chaotic dance of vehicles and pedestrians. From a throughput standpoint, the ideal intersection would cause no interruption to flow whatsoever, but you can't put a high five interchange on every city block. On the other hand, simple signs are cost effective and don't require any extra space, but they can't handle a lot of volume because they create an interruption for every single vehicle passing through the intersection. You can see why traffic signals are so popular. They aren't a panacea for all traffic problems, but they do offer a very nice balance of the considerations we discussed before. Relatively low cost, minimal space requirements, and the ability to handle large volumes of traffic with only some interruption. In their simplest form, traffic signals are a set of three lights facing each lane of an intersection. When the light is green, that lane has the right of way to cross. When the light is red, they don't. The amber light warns that the signal is about to change from green to red. Beyond this basic function, traffic signals can take on innumerable complexities to accommodate all kinds of situations. Let's take a look at a typical intersection here in the US to show how they work. At each approach to an intersection, there are three directions vehicles can go, called movements, right, through, or left. Right and through are usually grouped together as a single movement, so a typical four-way intersection has eight vehicle and four pedestrian movements. These movements can be grouped into phases of the traffic signal. For example, the left turn movements on opposite approaches can be grouped into a single phase because they can both go at the same time without conflicts. Traffic engineers use a ring and barrier diagram to sketch out how different phases of the signal are allowed to operate. Here's the ring and barrier diagram for our example intersection. The first phase is the major street left turns. Then the major street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. A barrier to clear the intersection. The minor street left turns. The minor street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. And finally, another barrier before the cycle starts again. Hi, I'm Rex Moore with The Motley Fool in front of BMW's self-driving exhibit. There are an endless variety of phasing arrangements that traffic engineers use to accommodate various intersection configurations and traffic volumes for each movement. Even the simple decision of whether to use protected or unprotected left turns takes a significant amount of analysis and consideration. Another important decision is how long each sequence of a phase should last. Ideally, a green light should last at least long enough to clear the queue that built up during the red light. This isn't always possible, especially during peak times on busy intersections. In these cases where the intersection is saturated, the green light might be extended for each phase to minimize the startup and clearance times, which are periods when the intersection isn't being utilized to its maximum capacity. The amber light needs to last long enough for a driver to perceive the warning and decelerate their vehicle to a stop at a comfortable rate. 
One second for every 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour on the speed limit is a general rule of thumb. But traffic engineers also take into account the slope of the approach and other local considerations when setting the timing for yellow lights. In most places in North America, you're allowed to enter an intersection for the full duration of a yellow light, which means there needs to be a time when all phases have a red light to allow the intersection to clear. This clearance interval is usually about a second but can be adjusted up or down based on speed limit and intersection size. So far we've only been talking about signals on a set timing sequence, but most traffic signals these days are more sophisticated than that. Actuated signal control is the term we use for signals that can receive input from the outside and use that information to make decisions about light timing and sequence on the fly. These type of signals rely on data from traffic detection systems. These sensors can be embedded cameras or radars, but most commonly they are inductive loop sensors embedded into the road surface. They are essentially large metal detectors which simply measure whether or not a car or truck is present, sometimes to the annoyance of bicycle, scooters, and motorcycles that may be too small to trigger the loop. Whatever the type of sensor, they all feed data into an equipment cabinet located nearby. You've probably seen hundreds of these cabinets without realizing their purpose. Inside this cabinet is a traffic signal controller, essentially a simple computer that is programmed with specific logic to determine when and how long each light will last based on the information from the detectors. Actuated control gives a traffic signal much more flexibility to handle variations in traffic load. For example, if a nearby road is closed and traffic rerouted through a signal that doesn't normally see such high demand, it may need to be reprogrammed before the closure. A light equipped with actuated control will simply see the additional traffic and adjust its phasing accordingly. Same thing with special events like concerts and sports games that create huge traffic demands on irregular schedules, and even seasonal changes in traffic like in major tourist destinations. Actuated systems can also keep you from waiting at a long light when no one's crossing in the other direction. Finally, Actuated control can help by giving priority to emergency vehicles and public transportation by using specialized detectors like infrared or acoustic sensors that communicate directly with certain types of vehicles. But actuated control isn't the end of the complexity, after all it still treats each intersection as an isolated entity, when in reality each signal is a component of a larger traffic network. And each component of the traffic network can have an impact, sometimes a major impact, on other components in the system. Take the classic example of two signals closely spaced in a row on a major roadway. If one signal gives a green but the next one doesn't, cars can back up. If they back up far enough, they can sit through multiple cycles at an intersection without being able to pass through until the light beyond clears. It's a frustrating experience for anyone. A signal is inadvertently but significantly reducing the capacity of an adjacent signal. One solution to this problem is signal coordination, where lights can not only consider the traffic waiting at their intersection, but also the status of nearby signals. This is a very common configuration on long corridors with relatively minor but frequent cross streets. The signals on the major road are timed so that a large group of vehicles, called a platoon by traffic engineers, can make it all the way through the corridor without interruption. This type of signal coordination can significantly increase the volume of traffic that can pass through intersections, but it really only works on stretches of road that don't have other sources of traffic interruptions, like driveways and businesses. If the platoon can't stick together, the benefits of coordinating signals mostly gets lost. The obvious next step in efficiency is coordination of most or all the signals within a traffic network. This is the job of Adaptive Signal Control Technologies, or ASCT. In adaptive systems, rather than individual groups of lights, all the information from detectors is fed into a centralized system that can use advanced algorithms like machine learning to optimize traffic flow throughout the city. These type of systems can dramatically reduce congestion, but they're only just starting to be implemented in major urban areas. As sensors become more ubiquitous and computing power increases, traffic management may slowly but surely be relegated from civil engineers to software developers and data scientists. On the complete opposite side of centralization, many believe that self-driving cars are the next revolution in traffic management. If every vehicle could communicate and coordinate with every other vehicle on the road, interrupted traffic control could eventually become a thing of the past. But don't get your hopes too high. In dense urban areas, traffic congestion is often self-limiting. Especially during peak times, for every one person on the road, 
There are many more at work or at home waiting for the congestion to clear up before they head out. This latent traffic demand means that any increase in capacity will quickly be filled up with more traffic, bringing the congestion back to the same level it was before. Okay, I know there was a lot of information that they, that they covered, but I hope that you did gain a little bit of knowledge about how traffic lights work, especially in the city. Uh, just to see if you were listening, what I want you to do right now is to send me the answer to this question. The question is a cluster of cars that are grouped together going through a traffic light is called what? Okay, a cluster of cars that are grouped together going through a traffic light was referred to as a what? All right, so I want you to text me that answer. Now, I also want you to write this down in your notes. I thought this was so much useful information when they explained it because I had never heard someone explain it this way that a yellow light stays yellow for every second above 10 miles per hour so if you're in a 30 mile an hour zone the yellow light's going to be three seconds if it's 40 four seconds 55 seconds and then there's going to be a red light for everybody for at least a second if not slightly a little bit more so make sure that you understand that you do not want to be going through a red light because if you going through a red light, there's a good chance the light's turning green for people that are coming from the opposite direction. And this is where we're going to have conflict. This is where you could have a crash. Good. Sabrina got it right. Um, the other thing I want you to write down is an Opticom light. Okay, O-P-T-I-C-O-M, light, cop the arm. Uh, close, close, the spelling's close. I'm not going to grade you on spelling, but you're, you're pretty close to what it's supposed to be. Now, an Opticom light, I don't know if you can see it here in the picture, but uh, right in front of us, there are two red lights that are grouped together. And if you really squint, if you really look really careful, there is a little tiny red light between those real bright red lights. An Opticom light comes on to indicate there's an emergency vehicle approaching from another direction. Okay, collect, got it, good, good. I see some of the correct answers coming in, good. Um, so an Opticom alerts you to fire trucks, police cars, and ambulances. So that's going to give everybody a red light. So everybody in this intersection right now has a red light. You can see it all the way around. All you can see is red, 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 all the way around. So I don't know where the emergency vehicle is coming from, but we're not going to move. We're not going to go left. We're not going to go right. We're going to stay right here and let the emergency vehicle try to filter its way through the intersection. Um, I want you to write down in your notes, there's a lot of information that we've got to go through. Right on red. Every single state allows vehicles to turn right on red. Now, in some metropolitan areas, some cities, they do not. And in some areas of Dover, some is worth, uh, you cannot turn right on red. So certain intersections, it will be posted by a sign. But I would say 80 to 85% of the intersections in New Hampshire, you can turn right on red. So how do you do that? How do you approach? How do you handle it? First thing you need to do is stop. I can't believe how many students get out of driver's ed and they they never, they said, oh, I thought you could turn right on red. And I go, yeah, you can, but you got to stop first. Oh, you have to stop? Well, yeah, that's what a red light means. Turning right on red means that after you've stopped, there's no traffic coming. Why wait? There's no need for you to wait any longer. There's no traffic coming. So why hold up traffic behind you? So the first thing you do is stop. Second thing you do is you look for a sign. Third thing you do is you look for traffic. So no sign, no traffic, turning right on red. So here's a question. Because you can turn on right on red, do you have to turn right on red? No, you don't. Okay, no, you don't. But if you've got someone behind you and they want to turn right on red, don't be surprised if they start leaning on the horn. 
because they want to turn right on red. So I never want you to feel uncomfortable turning right on red, but you've got to realize that it is something that you should learn how to do because you would be holding up people behind you. Um, Write this down. When traffic lights don't work, you follow the directions of a police officer. If there's no police officer around, you treat the intersection like a four-way stop. Okay, so write that down. When traffic lights don't work, like someone crashed into a telephone pole and the power went out, so the lights aren't working, or in a, a snowstorm, the lines go down, lights don't work. Treat it like a four-way stop. Everybody stops. Whoever was stopped first, then they go. Okay, a police officer is there. He will direct you to go or to stop. Sometimes, even though the light is green, there's no place for you to go. So don't get up into the middle of the intersection. Right now, that big car vehicle is in the middle of the intersection. He stopped. So that blue car should not go up behind him. You got to clear the intersection, keep the intersection open for other people. So don't always think that green means go. Green only means go if there's a place for you to travel to. If there's no place for you to travel, then you stay at the stop line until you can make it all the way across. And a lot of intersections in Dover now are getting posted uh, about keeping the intersection free of traffic. So don't block the intersections. They are having such a huge problem in Dover that they've had to put these signs up. They're, they're basically new, like within the last seven, eight months. Um, a light turns yellow. We're going to cover that right here. When a light turns yellow, you have two choices. You can either go through or you can stop, but it's based upon your location on the road. So write that in your notes. A yellow light means to go through or stop based upon your location. The closer you are to the light, the more likely you're going to go through. The further back you are from a traffic light, the more likelihood you're going to stop. So where is that, you know, in between point? Where is that area where you're going to go through? You've got to get used to finding it on your own. And I call it the point of no return. So in your notes, what a point of no return means, you're approaching a green traffic light. As the light turns yellow, you have already determined that if you get to, let's say, the telephone pole, if you get to that telephone pole with a sign on it, you've made up your mind you're going through. With the speed that you're traveling, the distance you've got left, I'm not going to be able to stop safely. So you've already predetermined your stopping distance, okay? So know your speed, know your stopping distance when you decide yes or no. Always know what's behind you because sometimes you may think, I better stop, but the person behind you is following too closely. You're going to have some serious problems, serious, serious problems. So you may want to still go through. And just practice finding that object. You could be a passenger in a vehicle. You don't have to be um, driving all the time to practice this. Watch people that you drive with, how they handle yellow lights. See what their speed is, you know, kind of lean over if you're in the front seat. Lean over and take a look how fast they're going. Look, you know, are they trying to find a point like we're talking about? Are they doing this correctly? And, and learn from their, their mistakes. Uh, Traffic lights with arrows are called protected turns. So a green arrow pointing left or right is a protected turn left or right. That means no other traffic is going in that direction. Now a red arrow to the right, look for signs. Some will tell you that you cannot, like in this situation, the sign is saying no turn on red arrow. So you cannot turn right on red. But if the sign was not there, then it becomes legal. Then you just stop, no sign, No traffic, turn right on red, it's legal. Left arrows, you've got to stop and wait for it to turn green if it's a steady light. So write this down in your notes. The when can you turn left on a red light? Most people think it's never. You can turn left on a red light that is blinking. So if you've got a blinking left 
red arrow. It's just like a stop sign. So it's telling you to stop, check, no traffic, no conflict, then you can go. So a blinking red light is really a stop sign. It's just that you see it from a further distance. Uh, always look for traffic around you um, because traffic lights, as we said, green means that it, you're able to go through the traffic light when it's safe. But there will be people running red lights. So I'm going to show you a video of people running red lights. Count how many seconds the light is red and people are still going through their red light. So we're not talking about people where it's just changing. It's just just a little bit red. We're talking about red, red, like for three, four, five seconds. It's incredible. The red light runners. So let's count seconds. One, two, three. So about three seconds. And by the way, that uh, stop line to the left is called a display stop line. Notice it's not the same location as the two lanes to the right. So let's take a look at the intersection. We're going to count when the light turns red. One, two, three, four. And look at a car just eked out on his green light. He never looked to the left to see that car running, the red light. That's why when you're the first car at a traffic light, always look to the left because that's where you're going to get hit from first. Okay, one, two, three. Look at, see the person still started to inch forward. He wasn't looking to the left, looking for traffic. He was looking only straight ahead. One, two, three, four, five, about four and a half seconds and he splits splits the two cars. One, two, he even passes a car that already stopped. Makes you wonder if the car in front of him stopped, why couldn't he stop? Went right around him. I think this one's pretty funny. One, two, three, four, five, five seconds. Then he realizes the trucks in front of him are bigger than he is. And he goes, whoop, I'm not going to win that battle. Now they get a little bit worse. Okay, that was a crash. Another situation where there's a stop. Uh, display stop line. Here's another crash. The bus basically blocks both people's view. The car that's running a red light can't see traffic that's coming out. The car that's coming out that had the green light couldn't see the guy running the red light. Now, I think number two is worse than number one. Tell me what you think. See if you think this is bad. Boom. He's just able to crawl. He's able to crawl off the roadway, barely. That's pretty bad. And I'll guarantee that the pedestrian did not have a walk signal. This is a pretty bad one. So a car is going to stop in the right lane and then there's going to be a car in the left lane. See, there's a car that's stopping. Then the other red car. He was so much further back than the first car that stopped. And now they're going to show you what it looked like from the other direction. So this is what it looks like from the other direction. So there's the car that's stopping. And look at the car that's still speeding up, trying to make it just barely misses hitting the bus. 
So why are we able to see these type of pictures? This is something that's called photo enforcement. So write this down. Photo enforcement is in major cities now because we're cutting back on police forces that they're going to patrol areas with cameras. So we do that for red light runners and we do it for people that are speeding. So you are not going to get pulled over by a police officer and given a ticket. You're going to go to the mailbox three weeks from now and you're going to open up your mail and find out that you've got a $105 fine for running a red light in Nashua. And you're going to go, I don't remember that. Well, wait a minute. Well, I was at the mall in Nashua. Yeah, they took your picture. And then they processed it. They found out who the car belonged to. And then now they're sending you your ticket in the mail. So photo enforcement is is happening. It's coming to the Granite State. It's coming to New Hampshire at some point. Um, we do have it, I believe, in Massachusetts and Connecticut at certain locations. Uh, but as far as I know, in the Seacoast area, we do not have it right now. But it is a thing that is real, and it's coming this way. Okay, crosswalks. What I want you to write down with crosswalks is that you must scan left or right if a pedestrian is waiting or approaching the crosswalk and will get to the crosswalk before you get within that area. It is your responsibility to stop for the pedestrian. Now, when you stop at a crosswalk, I want you to be about 10 feet away. I do not want your front bumper right up on the first line of the, the crosswalk. I do not want you when we're traveling in, in Dover in heavy traffic to stop on a crosswalk. You need to stay back. Now, if you stop for a pedestrian and they get at least halfway across going in the opposite direction, then you can continue on. But you do not want to have your vehicle moving towards a pedestrian. So they're walking towards the front of your car and right smack in the front of your hood. If you're still moving the vehicle at that point, I will break the car. I mean, I will break uh, my instructor brake and stop the car from moving. I call that pushing. When someone is in front of your car and you're moving, you're telling them, get going, go faster, because I want to go. You're holding me up, get going. Okay, I, I, I don't want that. Okay, so don't be surprised if you let go of the brake pedal and they're still in front of us, I'll, I'll stop the car again. Okay, I do not want to be pushing um, pedestrians to go faster. Bicycle traffic lights do happen in metropolitan areas. We don't have them around here. We do have bike lanes, though. So bicycles are supposed to follow the same rules and laws that we have. So green, of course, is to go. Yellow is to clear the intersection. Red is to stop. International signs, we should know um, just by shape that it's a taxi site where you get picked up and you do not want to go any further driving because that's a do not enter sign. See, we don't need words. The symbol tells us exactly. Um, also, the thing you need to remember is that what you see in your mirrors will be backwards. So right now, why is the guy driving on the wrong side of his vehicle? Why are the words backwards? Is because I took a picture of the side mirror while I was waiting in traffic. And think about this. You probably never, ever thought of this, that when you take a look at an ambulance from the outside and you're walking towards an ambulance, the word ambulance is spelled backwards. So when the ambulance is coming behind you and you look in your rearview mirror, you're going to be able to read it correctly because it's going to be spelt correctly. Think about it. Next time you see an ambulance, take a look at the word. It's spelt backwards in the front. Most of you probably never knew that or didn't even think about that. I'm going to show you one last clip. Uh, what technology is doing now is we're allowing uh, inside the vehicle uh, for people that don't scan very well, that we're giving you an indicator of what are the signs up ahead.
While driving, one passes so many traffic signs that sometimes even important information, such as speed limits or no overtaking signs, can get lost. The driver can also sometimes be distracted by traffic and not notice some of the signs. The Ford Traffic Sign Recognition System eliminates this issue by showing important traffic sign information in the instrument panel cluster. On display are speed limits and bans on overtaking, as well as their cancellation. The front camera records the traffic signs and transmits the respective data to the vehicle's traffic sign recognition system. The traffic sign recognition system uses an aging algorithm. This means that recently detected signs appear lighter. After a while, the color gets darker until the signs begin to gray out and finally completely disappear. This helps to make the driver aware of changes in real time. Okay, so that we're not going to be able to get through everything that we want to tonight. Um, I probably still have about another 20 minutes to a half hour on sign signals and payment marking. So we're going to add that to uh, Monday's class. So with Monday, I want you to read chapter 12 in responsible driving. Do the questions at the end of the chapter and to read chapter uh, or part six, section six in the manual. I am going to go on the home, um, the Facebook page to put a sample of questions for chapter three that you had to do last night. Uh, also covering some of the material that we covered today. So do that tonight or do it over the weekend and have that sent to me by uh, Tuesday. Now remember, I have openings tomorrow at two o'clock, uh, sometimes in the morning if anybody can drive. All day Saturday is open, so if people want to drive Saturday, I've got Monday afternoon, Tuesday afternoon open. So please text me later tonight to let me know what your availability is. Uh, we need to make uh, drive times this week because I think snow is coming uh, later in the week next week. So we may not have a day or two that we will be able to drive. So please text me and let me know your availability. So we're going to stop class right here tonight. Uh, like I said, I'll have the questions ready for you in about five minutes on the Facebook page. Please, please remember to uh, sign in on text message, sign out now on text message to me and communicate when you're able to drive and do your homework. I need this in your file. The state wants to know you're doing your work so you can get credit for it. So don't blow it off. Have a good weekend. See you. Bye.